So welcome uh, another edition of Art Now and Here, a special interview uh, with Sean Kelly, who is uh, the uh, lead in the Hidden Lives Illuminated animation project uh, in Pennsylvania state prisons. And just give us a background. What's your technical uh, association and how did you get involved in this project facilitating prisoners in Pennsylvania to do animation? Well, I work at Eastern State Penitentiary. It's a prison museum here in Philadelphia. So if you imagine Alcatraz, um, we don't have quite the size of the audience of Alcatraz, but we are getting there. It's an abandoned building and we give tours of the building talking about its history and we talk about its legacy and the, um, the really critical issues that face our nation today with criminal justice reform and in this era of mass incarceration. And so that's my day job. I'm the senior vice president uh, here at Eastern State Penitentiary. Um, we are always looking for ways of bringing the voices of people who are currently or formerly incarcerated into the work. It's one of the dangers of working at a historic site is that you can leave the impression that these things are over and that history is done. You know, and a lot of a lot of historic interpretation, as we say, is you no know, timeline, you know, and so you say, well, that was then, but this is now. Um, but in fact, these issues are still with us. The, there are still people who are uh, very much struggling or, or impacted by the history that we talk about. And so we're always trying to make connections to actual people um, who are in the systems that we talk about. And so, um, geez, about five years ago, uh, I went to one of our funders and said we could spend time uh, inside of prisons and getting the stories of men and women who are incarcerated and bring them out and um, incorporate them into our public programming, which is what we did. And it, it's interesting because I've been involved with the Community Partners in Action Prison Arts Program here in Connecticut. And uh, Jeffrey Green is the director of that. And we recently had the annual show at Eastern Connecticut State University. And it was through that show that I was introduced to your work and interested uh, on a bunch of different levels, one of which is I'm an animator myself. And animation, given the, the confines of uh, incarceration and whatnot, is a great activity. Animation is, uh, a, I'm not an animator, I'm not even an artist, but um, we hired a bunch of absolute top end animators to go into the prisons and, and work with um, the filmmakers, uh, the incarcerated filmmakers. Um, and I learned a fair bit about animation in that time. And, and the main reason we chose it to begin with was because you can animate and make a film without bringing in a camera. You know, and we didn't have the ability in a prison to bring in cameras and sound equipment and all that other stuff. Uh, we did end up bringing some sound equipment to record the voiceovers for one day. And uh, we did have eventually got access to iPads. And so the guys could do stop action animation, which you see run through a few of the pieces. Something else that we found is that animation is very forgiving art. I mean, it can be extraordinarily sophisticated um, in terms of the artistic practice and the attention to the, you know, the detail and the line and all the things that, that people spend their lives developing. But also you can do stop action animation that most people can become comfortable with it pretty quickly. And we found, and I hope you don't take this personally, Andrew, as an animator yourself, um, we found the most important thing was to write a good script. And that- Absolutely. If you have the good script and you record it well, and every one of our scripts was recorded by the filmmaker himself or herself, if you have that, then the images become, they support the ideas, but the images could be stop action photography, just you know, move around objects on the, on the bed of a, of a copy stand and taking a photograph every time you move the objects a little bit, or very simple drawings that are moved, you know, one per frame. And occasionally, actually quite often, our animators, because our, our filmmakers didn't have access to computers, the animators would take simple drawings that the guys would produce and then make them move back in the studio um, and then bring them back in and show them and say, what do you think? And the guys would say, it wasn't really what I had in mind. You could do this, you could do that. Um, but every single one of these films 
in the end, we had we created uh, 19 films, and every single one of them um, is lovely and poignant. And every single one of the filmmakers ended up, I'm very confident in saying this, very proud of the work in the end. And that was something that we took very seriously because it was a real act of trust. I mean, these guys, a lot of them had never created a work of art or something they would have classified a work of art. They never made a film. They'd never drawn anything, you know, aside from when they were in school or something. And we're saying, we're going to take all of this and we're going to put it on the wall. We projected these films, by the way, on outside wall of our prison every night for a month. And so we're saying thousands of people are gonna see this. And it's a real act of trust for the, um, the filmmakers inside of a prison to say, you're not gonna make me look like an idiot, you know? Yeah. What was What's so great about the animations is they're, as you say, very, it has sort of a homespun organic look to it. And the narrations are absolutely from the heart and speaking of, of uh, in many cases of places and points in their lives of, of each of the, the animators that are, you know, uh, fulcrums, you know, in their, in their own lives. And uh, so it's, a, it's so much from very much from the heart and it each, as you say, the animations are simple in a, in a sense, but so heartfelt and organic in nature that it's, it's really endearing. I mean, animation these days, runs the gamut you know i love the stop action animation uh, i started out using a 16 millimeter bolex uh, single framing camera and now in this day and age we live in you have the uh top shelf uh cgi computer generated animation of the pixars and the toy stories and it, it's really it's it, animation has taken on a, a a life of its own where it's become so much a part of a lot of like uh narrative films and the special effects and whatnot and uh i love the i love the homespun stuff myself and that was yeah. so endearing about these films yeah they're really terrific one of the things that um one of our animators told us was that when people first start getting into animation if they draw extremely well it can be a challenge when they first start because the, the instinct is to um, is to really um, uh, lavish attention on the drawings, and the, each drawing is called a cell, C E L, which I didn't know, but of course, uh, standard animation terminology. But each cell, you have to make so many of them that you can't put that much time into each. Well, you could, but you'll be there forever. And so um, there was only one person in the class who. Um, would have would identify himself as a visual artist who came into the class with strong drawing skills. Um, and the rest of them all felt fairly insecure about the drawing skills. And our animators worked with each one of them and found a technique um, that worked for each one of those people. And every single film, they all have a different look and a different feel and a different sound bed underneath them. Um, and yet I still think they hold together as a set too. Like they have enough of a through line that feel like they're part of one project and and as you say i mean really to 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 create motion and animation to a large extent in drawings you really only need two drawings and those interlacings of two drawings uh is i love that effect too and yeah the animation is really great and it, it, it's great to see people sort of like uh investing in something that they've never done before and finding something in, within themselves that they may never have been able to uh, uncover were it not for the situation they found themselves in. Right. And, um, not that I would wish that on anyone, but um, it is, um, you know, I, at the beginning of this project, I sort of naively thought, you know, well, I, I don't know. It, I had a, a lot of naive ideas about, um, I'd worked in prisons fairly regularly, but I still am always learning. I've never been incarcerated myself. I'm still always learning. Um, for instance, at, at the beginning of the project, I told the Department of Corrections that we would use as a theme routines. And I thought that that, that would keep us away from images of violence or sexuality or uh, grievances against the Department of Corrections itself and all of the areas that the DOC was not going to want to see these films go. Um, and I was just mistaken, you know, that most of the filmmakers said, our lives are just endless routines. Like, why would you want to spend more time talking about routines? 
So many of them want to talk about their families. You see that thread run through them. Um, or they want to talk about their childhoods. And what if you're the one to talk about the justice system itself and, and the prison system? And the Department of Corrections had their concerns about how that was going to come out sounding. And so there's a lot of negotiation and a lot of metaphor that got worked in. Of, of um, We didn't want to tell any of the filmmakers they couldn't make the film they wanted, but we also had to make sure that the Department of Corrections um, didn't just censor the entire thing. And so um, we had a, a storyteller, it was by the name of Starfire, who was a consultant to the project. She was wonderful sitting down with the filmmakers and saying, you know, they're not gonna let you say this word or this use this image, but you know, we can get there, we can get the same message across with different language, with different images and, and can still be there. It just has to be not quite as overt. And uh, it's just wonderful. Yeah, the, the, an, an interesting uh, question came up in my, in my mind is, so as a, an outgrowth of, uh, of the program, have you found uh, people saying, hey, this is something I want to do as a career? Has it taken on a vocational aspect of things? Only in one sense. One of the filmmakers now, um, now works here at Eastern State Penitentiary. So uh, when he came home, we hired him. So he's made a vocation out of um, being a, an educator inside of a historic site. Um, so, um, but aside from that, um, I don't know if any of them literally transferred this over to a, a, an actual job skill in the most literal sense, but I know that it brought a lot of meaning and we didn't really um, actively, we didn't anticipate how much the families of the incarcerated filmmakers would become involved and become connected to the project, but they were really wonderful. And it's a Pennsylvania state prison. So some of the families weren't in Philadelphia, but quite a few of them were in Philadelphia, where our museum is, and including one family that was right around the corner, literally a block and a half away. And so over the course of the 15 months that the films were being developed, we got to know these families pretty well. Um, and they came to a lot of the screenings when we were up and running, and it was just this wonderful thing. But it was also an act of of uh, trust for them to say that you're not going to make my loved one look like an idiot. You're not going to make him look like a thug. You know, you're going to you're going to support the storytelling that is from the heart from this person who is, you know, in this very compromised situation of being able to speak for themselves. And so um, it was a wonderful part of the project. And we've stayed close. I've stayed close with a couple of those families ever since. It gives uh, families something to connect about that isn't about all the other things they're dealing with. And it's right. something that's genuine, sincere, and in a way for the, the people that are, that are involved in the program, I'm sure, and for their families, at some way that they can connect that's outside the visiting room, it's over the barbed wire, and they're, they're uh, finding themselves making a connection that is outside the context of the the prison visiting room and the legal travails that they're all prisoners are going through and and whatnot so it's something that's pure and new and great at, for families to connect about and in a time when a lot of the vocational uh, opportunities and correctional systems have been, have evaporated due to budget cuts and retirements and and the like over the last uh, decades uh, this is something that's sort of has a, a potential to be vocational in the sense of people are collaborating, they're communicating, they're working on a project that, and that has a con that uh, has a context in the work environment, no matter what field they're gonna be involved in. And they're reuniting with their family. So it's, an, uh, it's something that's generally just all good. Absolutely. That's interesting to hear you say that gives them something to bond over. I hadn't really, I hadn't thought about it in quite that light, but it's true that they're, they're bonding over this storytelling technique. It's something they can bring the extended family to come see. Um, we had a big finale where all the families came and we had hundreds of people there and showed all the films at once. And it was a lot of the extended families were there and, and it was just um, such a positive energy. And, 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 and the families can say, hey, look, look at this great thing that's done. Whatever's going on in the past, regardless, look at this new chapter of this person's life and, and something that's genuine, genuine and heartfelt. And here it is going out into the world. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, amazing. I really, really love that part of engaging 
artists and like in the films, I love the shots of the, the, the families in the visiting room are able to take pictures with their uh, loved ones that are incarcerated and how those are manipulated in different animations. That's some of my favorite stuff. It's really great, isn't it? Yeah, you can see how the kids. Um, one of the uh, one filmmakers, Justino, his film, um, his film is about his son. It's one that's called Piano Priest. And it's all about just the love he has for his son. Um, I just saw Justino this week, though only at a distance when I, I was up in one of the prisons. And he and his family and I have, have remained in touch over the years since the project ended. Um, but anyway, yes, it's all about his love of his son. And, and um, there's quite a bit of that that runs through there. The, the, the work with the women introduces a lot of people to the idea that, oh, yeah, there's a lot of women incarcerated in America. And then you also have the program, the WAGS program, where there's that great piece of one of the uh, guys who was training the dogs and looking, uh, they were a part of a project to find them forever homes. And mm -hmm. those are just a, it's just such a great way to tell a story that I don't think a lot of people, you know, out in the world, outside the uh, correctional, you know, system understand that th there's a lot of things going on behind the walls uh, that, that aren't what maybe uh, the first thing that comes to people's mind. It's true. Um, yeah, the, that's a that's Joe's film, Joe Spinks's film about the dogs. Um, I just saw him last week when I was up in one of the prisons. Um, there are all sorts of programs happening inside of prisons, but people who want to stay busy in prisons can stay very busy. Um, uh, there's just a lot of a lot of activities happening inside the prisons. I wrote an article once uh, with a man I'm proud to call a friend of mine who's home now, but at the time he was uh, incarcerated. And uh, it was an article about time. And I said, um, I interviewed him and we just published it as, a, as an interview. And I said, you know, does time move differently now that you're on the inside? You know, the cliche is the person who's writing the numbers on the wall, you know, the hash marks on the wall. And he said, yeah, it moves so much faster. So I just feel like weeks just fly past and it's a week of my life I'll never get back. So uh, people in prison can, can keep themselves busy, at least in some prisons. You know, there's a, a phenomenon I've, I've noticed over the years, which is that um, prisons that are located near major cities tend to have more volunteers. You know, um, in our case, our staff was paid, but they weren't paid by the state or by, they were paid by us. They were paid by a grant that we had gone out and gotten. So, those programs tend to happen in the prisons that are close to large cities um, or close to universities. Um, and so here in Pennsylvania, uh, it's a very, um, it's a really varied state. And so we have Pennsylvania, we have Philadelphia, we have Pittsburgh, but there's a lot of mountainous rural um, counties in between and in the north. And um, the prisons that are located in those locations don't get many volunteers coming in at all. They don't get universities right. coming in to offer programs. Um, they don't get they don't get programs like ours who want to work inside prisons um, to get in, and so it's I, I see this just again and again that um, there's a real difference in, in what kind of programs are available, often depending how close the prison is to a major major city. Yeah, well, Sean, I appreciate you taking the time, and it's, this is a tremendous uh, program, and uh, we're going to be showing the Hidden Lives Illuminated series of animations here on SCC TV. And we'll show this interview as well on the Art Now and Here uh, show. And then we're looking forward to highlighting the film at a great uh, screening at uh, the Hygienic Art Park, uh, August 19th in New London, Connecticut. It's a great uh, venue uh, outside under an amphitheater uh, setting. And we have a, a, a newly installed LED uh, video wall. So they're going to be presented in a great uh, uh, context and uh, uh, dignify the work as best, uh, you know, as we can, because it deserves a, 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 a beautiful presentation and we're, we're going to give it to them. That is so wonderful. I wish I could be there. That's terrific. I'll tell the guys that I'm, that, uh, I'm still in touch with and I'll tell Jerome, who works here, one of the filmmakers who works here now on our staff, uh, that that's going to be happening. It's so lovely. It's just really great. Well, I can give you one big scoop, and this hopefully some people will appreciate this. But uh, on that on that card, uh, along with the Hidden Lives Illuminated animations, is going to be 
a work called uh, Your Face by an animator named Bill Plimpton. And that was an Academy Award nominated film in 1987. Wow. I know Bill so Plimpton. You can, you, you can tell the guys are, they're going to be in good company. That's fantastic. Yeah, really wow, great. And uh, looking forward to it and so much uh, more to be learned about your program. And uh, thanks so much, uh, Sean. Thanks uh, for Eastern Connecticut State University for making the connection because it was through the uh, presentation of the uh, Community Partners in Action Prison Arts Program annual show, which was hosted at Eastern Connecticut uh, State University, that I got in touch uh, with you and uh, really appreciate all the work you're doing down there in Pennsylvania. And the idea of, uh, you know, spreading the love through animation is uh, just such a such a great idea. That's fantastic. Hey, can I give it another uh, quick shameless plug? That, sure. Uh, uh, if anyone watching wants to see the films, um, obviously you want to go and, and see them in, in New London. But if, um, if you also want to check them out or see them later uh, at home, uh, if you just Google Hidden Lives Illuminated, um, you should okay. find it. Uh, it has its own website. And you can watch all the films on the website. But certainly seeing them live with an audience is the, way, the best way to see them. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, the you know festival environment and whatnot. But needless to say, you want to find people uh, where they are these days. And needless to say, that a lot of people are uh, consuming their media in a streaming manner. And we'll put a link up somewhere up there, maybe right about here now. <laughs> and if it's all right with you, we'll put this interview on YouTube too. That'd be fantastic. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank Look you, forward Anders. to learning more what's going on uh, with the Hidden Lives Illuminated program. And uh, thank you again so much. And thank you to all the people that have facilitated this program and all to all the people that uh, uh, made these films and everybody and, 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 and Godspeed to them as they go on their journey uh, on uh, you know this earth here. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrew.